Thank you, Mr Hansen. It's a pleasure to see you in the chair. I beg to move that this House is considered the High Court judgment on the benefit cap. On June 22, 2017, a ruling was made in response to a judicial review against the imposition of the benefit cap brought by four lone parent families who had three children under the age of two. This was supported by Gingerbread, Shelter and the Child Poverty Action Group, all of whom I thank for their briefings on this matter. The judgment was damning of this Tory government, and I intend to refer to Mr Justice Collins' judgment in my speech, and I would absolutely commend it to anybody who has any interest in this issue. Mr Justice Collins was quite clear in his findings, Mr Hanson. Whether or not the defendant accepts my judgment, the evidence shows that the cap is capable of real damage to individuals such as the claimants. They are not work shy, but find it, because of the care difficulties, impossible to comply with the work requirement. Most lone parents with children under two are not the sort of households the cap was intended to cover. And since they will de depend on DHP, they will remain benefit households. Real misery is being caused to no good purpose. Mr Hansen, in response, the DDWP say that they intend to appeal this decision. I find this truly shocking, and I would urge the Minister here today to reconsider, unless she supports misery being caused to no good purpose. Looking back at the Government's own assessment prior to the 2015 Welfare Bill, there was an acceptance that the policy of reducing the cap from £26,000 to £20,000 and £23,000 in London would impact disproportionately on women. It even stated that most of the single women affected are likely to be lone parents. This is because we expect the majority of households affected by the policy to have children. The local government associations say that this lower cap is being, is being implemented without a full understanding of the impact of the original cap. I ask the Minister, what did they expect to happen? The, justice, the findings by Mr Justice Collins is that the policy is unlawful and discriminates against female single parents. The Supreme Court has said previously that the benefit cap breaches the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and that it cannot possibly be in the, in the best interests of the children affected by the cap to deprive them of the means to to deprive them of the means to with adequate food, clothing, warmth and housing, the basic necessities of life. Mr Justice Collins reiterates this point in his findings uh, at point 40. He says, the effect of the cap means that the children and their parents have restrictions on what can be provided by way of food, housing, food and other things that an average child should have available. Further, as ministers have said, it will be necessary to try to move to cheaper accommodation to avoid the effect of the cap so there will be an upheaval for the family. I have set out the evidence of the damage to both family and the private life which the cap has produced and will continue to produce. Good morning, Premier McGuffey. Of course. Thank you. I commend my honourable friend on the sterling work that she's done with this campaign. Has the UK Government, in her conversations with her, indicated how this policy is compatible with the Government's family test? They have not, um, and the family test would appear to be something that the government has said in some grand papers and then not implemented at all. According to the most recent DWP statistical release from May of this year, 66,000 households have been capped as of February, up from 46,000 in November 2016 due to the lower cap, cap being applied. 74% of households capped as of February were ca only capped because of the, reduction of the, lower cap, the introduction of the lower cap levels. 72%, some 48,000 uh, capped households are single parent families. 79%, 38,000 of single parent capped households have at least one child aged under five years, including 15%, that's 7,200, with a child aged under one at February 2017. At February 2017, 83%, 55,000 of capped households had between one and four children, and 10%, 6,800 um, have five or more children. A very small number in that whole. Um, uh, pool of people, but those are significant figures, Mr Hansen, and each of those is hiding its own tale of misery. I'm not even convinced that this policy will save money, as there are significant consequential costs. The cost of bad debt to councils and housing providers when the rent costs can be no longer met by that tenant, that single parent in a household who has been capped. The cost of court proceedings to evict that individual to go through that process, to reinstate the property after eviction um, and to bring it back onto the market. The cost of temporary housing for that family once they've been evicted and have presented themselves at social work in need of housing. The local government association estimates that, that the cost of temporary housing is sitting at two million pounds per day. Two million pounds per day that we don't need to be spending by evicting people um, as a result of this cap. The cost to children's services and mental health services due to the stress on that family, the stress of not being able to pay the bills, the stress of going into housing arrears, the stress of eviction and homelessness 
and all of those other things, perhaps having to leave your home and the support network round about you. The cost of the education of the children involved as they are forced to move schools, because it's not just the younger children, but it might be their older siblings in the family that they ha might have to move schools and go to a different area, away from family, away from support networks. All of these are costs, Mr Hanson, and we must take them into mind. Single parent families of young children are forced by this government into a no-win situation. They cannot earn enough via work because they can't take on a job which will pay them enough um, to get out of the cap. They can't take on more, more than the 16 hours that they need because they have childcare obligations to those children under two. For some of the parents that are involved in this case, uh, the mothers are breastfeeding, which makes it more difficult as well to go out and start work when you have obligations to go back and feed that child. And we should not be forcing them to do so because, as we know, those early years with, um, with your child are extremely valuable. The families cannot are also trapped because they can't get enough support from the state. This leaves them, sadly, Mr Hanson, with destitution, with food banks and with ill health, both physical health and mental health. These are women doing their best, struggling to provide a better life for their children. We should be helping them, not coying the legs from under them. The Scottish Government's independent advisor on poverty and inequality, Naomi Eisenstadt, said just yesterday, I think, uh, that life outcomes are largely determined by the wealth and social class of one's parents at birth. It represents not just fundamental unfairness, but also, also significant waste of talent and opportunity for the economy and the social cohesion of Scotland. I would argue that that applies more widely to the UK as well. And by taking the circumstances of parents, by punishing them, by not allowing them the means that they need to feed their families, we are stunting the life chances of those children as they go through their life. We are punishing people for the circumstances that they are in, Mr Hanson. The UK Government will say, as they always say in these types of debates, that the best way out of poverty is work and that those receiving benefits should face the same choices as those supporting themselves solely through work. If those phrases are on the Minister's sheet today, I'd advise her to cross them out just now. Mr Justice Collins stated, those observations are entirely irrelevant in relation to lone parents such as the claimants who find themselves in real difficulty in being able to enter work because of the need to care for a child under two. The circumstances um, of the parents in this case, I think, are, are worth reading out, uh, Mr Hanson, in full, just in case um, those looking at Hansard or those watching at home haven't had the chance to go um, and read through some of these circumstances. So the first uh, claimant, DA, was homeless, living with her four-year-old son in a refuge in North London as a result of serious domestic violence from her husband, which led her ha to her having to leave her council flat. She's due to give birth in mid-June. While living in the refuge, she was not subjected to the cap because it doesn't apply to those victims of violence who have to live in a refuge. It was submitted that she was not able to be a claimant since she was not a loan payment with a child under two and was living in a refuge. That objection has not been seriously maintained since she will become subject to the cap when she gives birth on leaving the refuge. Furthermore, I was informed that she's now been given temporary accommodation for those who are homeless, which costs £247 per week. She's investigated the possibility of private accommodation, but as found, is confirmed by her solicitor and who has made a statement based on her experience of dealing with the many clients who are homeless or suffering the effects of the benefit cap of the bedroom tax, that very few private landlords are prepared to accept tenants who depend on housing benefit, particularly if they are capped. As, as must be obvious, when she gives birth, she will not be able to work, particularly if she wishes to breastfeed. Cont furthermore, the council has refused to allow her to join its housing list since she came from outside the area as she was fleeing violence and does not have the necessary four-year residence in that borough. She has been informed that when capped, she will have £217 per week available for rent. She has mental and physical pro problems, as does her son. She is anxious to work when she can. The other claimants are also um, equally worthy cases and worthy of um, everyone's attention in this House. Um, but I would like to mention this, this last year, um, a parent who has his four children. WBA has four children aged 17, 14, 13, 7 and 14 months. Uh, and the youngest also being a claimant. The youngest child was conceived following rape by her husband. She has indeed been the victim of an, of an abusive relationship over the years. She has, since February 2017, been living in suitable accommodation, but the cap has resulted in a shortfall of £151.76 per week. She was able to obtain DHPs, but only for short term, with no promise that they would continue. And having been granted a DHP on 20th of April 2017, the Council wrote to a letter to the same day saying it had been cancelled. The way she has been treated has distressed her. She wishes to work when she can. Now, I would mention uh, the, the other campaign that I'm involved in, the, the rape clause. This, this family are going to lose... Uh, potentially their rights to um, ch the child element of child tax credits and universal credit, unless the, the mother there fills in the form to say that she's been raped. This is a family already under significant pressure 
uh, Mr Hanson, and they deserve support. They don't deserve further demonisation and stigmatisation as a result of this. Now, the government will, will talk about childcare, and they will say that um, they are offering childcare to people, um, and that that is an important point. Actually, that is not an important point or a relevant point in this case. First of all, the nursery places that they are offering, the money that they are offering, is not for under twos, this specific group. The cost of nursery places, particularly for under twos, can be absolutely prohibitive in a lot of cases, particularly because of the childcare ratios for under twos, which, are, which bear a higher cost, and some um, nursery providers will charge more for an under two than they will for a three or four year old um, for a childcare place. Some nurseries don't deal with under twos at all, they don't take babies. So there are issues of availability, flexibility, um, as well as with cost. And if the parent is going out to work, and essentially they are working to pay for the nursery place, they're not working to bring extra money into the house, they're working for that nursery place. Um, and they can't always rely on families because they might have had to leave and move to a different part of the country, a cheaper part of the country, so that they can actually afford the housing, which the government is putting in that situation as well. And they can't rely on their older family members because they might be waspy women who've been forced back to work as well and then can't carry out childcare tasks as they might have done before. So this is not really a choice for a lot of these women. With regard to other options about the, the, the situation where the government expects women to make the same choices regardless of their circumstances. Now, some of the women in the cases that I mentioned do not have the same choices as we all would like to have. Some women don't have the choice over their reproductive rights. They may be raped. They may not want to have a termination. They may not have all the choices um, that, that they would want to have. And it's interesting that Turn to Us, the benefits charity who run a helpline, say that they have an increase in people inquiring about whether or not um, they should proceed with a pregnancy as a result of the benefit cap. That is absolutely appalling that government is forcing women into making choices okay. such as those. Also, the, the women in this case did not become single parents by choice. They became single parents by circumstance. These things happen in life. We can't always choose that how we set off in life is how we end up in life. But the benefit system should be a, a supportive safety net. It should not be something that punishes women for the circumstances that they are in, particularly for women who are facing domestic violence. And there's a, an interesting point around domestic violence in these cases as well, because the chief executive of um, the Women's Aid Federation, who gave evidence to this case, mentioned that there is, has become, because of the perverse nature of this system, um, bed blocking in refuges because women are not subject to the cap while they remain in the refuge the second they leave the refuge they are so that creates an unfairness in that system it means that other women can't come into the refuge because other women can't afford to leave they literally can't afford to leave because they will lose so much money in doing so and it's absolutely appalling that women are forced to make that choice and it also forces women into making the choice of leaving in the first place because if women know that they can't possibly afford to support themselves with the benefit cap, with the children they already have, going into housing, which is possibly expensive private lets, they'll stay and they will risk the safety of themselves and their children in doing so. This government should take heed of that, if nothing else. Absolutely. Um, if I'm being uh, generous to this government, is it possible um, that, well, it's, in fact, it cannot be possible that any minister could sit here listening to those cases and intend for these people to live in these circumstances? Is it not more likely that the ide ideology of austerity and uh, arbitrary caps is forcing people through policy into these circumstances? And they should Absolutely. This entire policy and the way that people are um, ending up as a result of this needs to be reviewed because it is causing, as the judge points out, genuine hardship to no good cause. And we need to look at this whole policy in the round. There's also, um, within this, the, the government will say, oh, there's DHP, there's discretionary housing payment. Yes, there is. The savings from the benefit cap amount to 155 million. The amount put towards the DHP by the government is, is 37.1 million. There is no way that this amount of money can be made up through that. There is no way. The Local Government Association have, have said that the cumulative impact of welfare reform is causing a housing affordability crisis in this country. And the government has a huge part to play in this. There are a lack of options for women in rehousing. Where do they move to that will be cheaper than where they live now? If it's in a city like London, it would probably mean leaving London altogether and the family support networks and the schools and other things that you might have. 
There's a lack of social rented housing, particularly in some parts of England. A lot of those used to be, uh, Mr Hanson, uh, local authority housing that was um, either bought under the right to buy um, or gone off to housing associations or other um, areas where there is less control over that housing. There has not been enough housing built in its place to replace it. Um, so there are fewer options for people, and those private lets are extremely expensive. And as mentioned, if you're a private landlord um, and you see somebody coming who you think isn't going to be able to pay their bills in a few months' time, you're not going to take them on. And that is mentioned um, in the judgment as well. Um, I can't find the specific... Yeah. The reality is, he, um, a Mr... Mr... A... Yeah. <laughs> The reality is the DHPs do sorry, the reality is the DHPs do involve short term payments and give those affected no peace of mind whatsoever. Thank you. Can I say firstly um, how gratified I am uh, that the Honourable Member for Glasgow Central obtained this debate. And I would like just to put in one extra figure at this stage, um, which is a, a mere three thousand two hundred and seventy three thousand two hundred and seventy children who in Scotland have been affected by this cap. You have heard harrowing, harrowing tales of individuals that suffer in the face of this cap and the difficulty that this government is placing those individuals, an ultimate Hobson's choice that single parents, predominantly mums, have to make over their children. And when we look at Scotland, 3,270 individual children who are being made subject to this cap they are under 18, they don't vote, and their parents have to make the choice. Alison Thewis. I agree with the Honourable Member um, and his observation there. The, the further um, point about DHPs um, within the court judgment is that um, after inquiring to local authorities about their practising in dealing with DHPs, um, the judgment says of the 235 um, who responded, none had ever made a permanent award, nor had any agreed to make a payment before a tenancy commenced. So somebody going into a new tenancy can't expect to get that, won't expect to get that, and neither will the landlord expect to receive it. Um, it's not enough of a, an option at all. Um, and the very nature of discretionary housing payments is they are discretionary. They are at the discretion of whoever that person is going to, and they are oversubscribed in many areas because people know that that's their only option in trying to top up um, a dwindling income as a result of um, government policy. The other options um, in moving people to cheaper areas, so-called cheaper areas around the UK, is that those areas also tend to have higher rates of unemployment, and you're not actually moving to people to an area where they're more likely to get work. They're going to get work in areas where, where rents are higher because there is more demand in those areas. Um, and I think it is particularly worrying um, the issue of um, private landlords, and within the, the judgment as well, it mentions that... Um, evidence from the residential and the national landlords associations say that private landlords are very reluctant to take on tenants who were capped and many would seek to evict such tenants, not even that they wouldn't get a tenancy, they'd be evicted from the tenancy that they had, which seems particularly um, cruel. So all of these things within this policy, all of these problems are avoidable. They are a result of government policy. And there is a choice here for the government. We are now in a very different situation than we were before the election. There is no majority for austerity in this House any longer. The government has a choice. It does not have to spend to waste um, further money on appealing this. It's already wasted you know, more than half a million pounds, I understand, and at least in other court appeals to do with the bedrooms tax and the case on carers', carers allowance. So they should not waste more public funds on appealing a case which has already been proven to be an injustice. They should say, hands up, there is an injustice here. We will put this right in the interests of the children that are affected um, by this. We have a choice, Mr Hanson. This government has a choice. I would urge them not to take um, the Chancellor's view where he says that they're weary of austerity, but to do something about it. For these women, for their children, for families right across the UK, if money can be found on the magical money tree of a billion pounds to prop up this government, it can be found for women and children right across these islands. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the question is that this House has considered the High Court judgment on the benefit cap. I call Minister Caroline Danish. Thank you, Mr Hanson. It's a great pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, and I would like to congratulate the Member for Glasgow Central on securing this important debate on the benefit cap High Court judgment. She's absolutely right to bring this to the House. Um, the Government, as 
she knows, is committed to building a country that does work for everybody. And this means taking action to help and encourage people into work in order to move away from a life of welfare dependency and to restore fairness between those who pay into the system and those who access it. We believe that those out of work should not receive more in benefits than many working families are able to earn. Before the cap, the Department of Work and Pensions disproportionately spent £10 million per year on just 300 families, Mr Hanson. We introduced the benefit cap, as she said, in 2013 at a national rate of £26,000 a year. It's aimed to encourage people to find work, and that is exactly what has happened. We wanted to do that on the principle that work doesn't just pay, Mr Hanson, it brings self-esteem, it brings better health, it brings better happiness and improved self-confidence, as well as much more opportunity for social mobility for children in that household. The evaluation of the original cap shows that that is what has happened. Uh, capped households are 41% more likely to go into work than uncapped households, and 38% of those capped who were interviewed said they were doing more to find work. And the original cap met its aims, but the change was mainly felt in London and the South East. To spread the work incentives across the country, we introduced a lower tiered cap in November last year, which aims to build on the original successes. The new tiered cap is set at £23,000 for couples and lone parents in Greater London and £20,000 for other parts of the country. Now, this is an equivalent salary of £25,000 or £29,000 in London. We know that four out of ten households in London earn less than this and four out of ten households in the rest of the UK earn less than this. So that is a system that is fair to people that use it, but also fair to those that pay for it. The cap levels continue to provide a clear incentive to work. Households are only required to work part-time hours in order to be exempt from it. So households who claim working tax credits by working just 16 hours a week for lone parents are, um, or are earning £520 a month on universal credit are exempt from the cap. However, we acknowledge, of course, that there are, for some people, the move into work just isn't appropriate, which is why there are a range of exemptions for vulnerable groups. This includes those households in receipt of most disability benefits, of carer's allowance, the, the equivalent uh, universal credit carer's element, and the guardian's allowance. And that's why we were disappointed with the High Court Judicial Review decision, which challenged the application of the cap to lone parents with children under the age of two, Mr Hanson. The court gave the government the ability to appeal and we will be appealing this decision as we strongly believe that work is the best way for people to raise their living standards. We know that children whose parents work benefit from increased life chances. They're li less likely to grow up in poverty. Evidence shows that one of the biggest drivers of child poverty is long-term worklessness and low earnings. And I would like to take the opportunity to respond to some of the issues that the Honourable Lady particularly has raised. The latest labour market statistics show that we continue to have a record number of people in work. In April, there were nearly 32 million people in work. And the evidence shows that work is the best route out of poverty. But there are also record numbers of lone parents in employment. It's not easy. Very few people choose in life to be a lone parent. I know. I never made the choice to be a lone parent myself. And yet I was a lone parent working, making the same difficult decisions that lone parents, particularly mothers, up and down the country have to make every single day. An evaluation of the be previous benefit cap showed that it had changed attitudes and behaviours. One in five of all capped households went to work after a year, compared to just 11% of similar uncapped households previously. Importantly, capped lone parents were 51% more likely to be in work after a year compared to similar uncapped lone parents' households. Those surveyed said that this new employment had brought financial rewards. Some people felt better off and able to afford extra treats for their children, but also other rewards, um, rewards in terms of health, in terms of happiness, in terms of self-esteem. Now, the Honourable Gentleman for Glasgow East talked about the family test, but I think he is mistaken about what the family test is and has very far too, too simplistic a view of it. It's not a tick box exercise, but a way of assessing the impact of a policy on a whole range of family measures. It is just not in children's best interests to live in workless households. Children's life chances and opportunities can be significantly damaged 
as a result of living in households where no one has worked for years and where parents don't consider work as an option. And let's face it, this is only requiring people to work for 16 hours a week. Children in households where no parent or carer are in work are much more likely to show challenging behaviour by age five. And um, parental worklessness has been shown to significantly be associated with poorer academic attainment and greater behavioural problems in children aged seven. And growing up in a workless household is associated with a higher risk of being neat, not in education, employment or training in late adolescence. David yes. talking here about the importance of work and, and making sure that we've got, we don't have worklessness households, but... Part of the problem is that this government does, has done very, very little to actually tackle pay inequality. And one of the things that this government is bringing forward is a living wage that does not seek to support under-25s. And I'm afraid that nothing that the Minister is saying is, is reassuring you that there's any attempt by this government to really tackle pay inequality, particularly for under-25s, which this government will be actively discriminating against with its false living wage. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Hanson, I'm afraid he's just wrong. 1.3 million people on the lowest incomes will have been taken out of income tax altogether since 2015. In April 20, 2017, we increased the national living wage to £7.50. That will benefit 12 million workers directly this year, and we'll see, me and a full-time worker um, on that rate, we'll see their annual pay increase by over £500. Now, um, one of the issues that was raised was that the benefit cap is forcing people to move. And our evaluation of the original cap that actually found that very, very few households moved house. And where they have moved, the vast majority have actually moved locally. Uh, I'm particularly concerned about her uh, arguments in uh, the respect of vulnerable women. Previously to doing this job, I was the Minister for Women and Equalities. And the violence against women and girls agenda is something very close to my own heart, which is why I'm delighted the government has committed over £100 million to tackling uh, violence against women and girls. And of course, in any circumstances, it is absolutely unforgivable. That's why um, we recognise that some groups find it harder to adapt to benefit caps. Pregnant women, new mothers, victims of domestic violence are examples. And that's why we've, we've explicitly stated in the guidance that um, direct housing payments should provide targeted help to women within 11 weeks of an expected childbirth, to households with children under nine months or under Mr Hanson, and to prioritise um, women who need safe accommodation such as sanctuary houses. And housing benefit can be paid for both the home a victim has fled and the refuge or other temporary accommodation for up to 52 weeks. Um, uh, and that 52-week limit is to avoid the, um, the blocking uh, issue that she, that she specified. Um, and, of course, it is disregarded from the benefit cap. Now, uh, with regard to the Scottish statistics, 7,300 households have been capped since the benefit cap was introduced in Scotland. And of those, over half, 50%, are now no longer capped, with 21% moving into work. The cap is having a positive impact. We can always find negative and distressing stories. And where those happen, she is more than welcome to bring them to my desk and bring them to my attention. But you have to look at the vast majority of people who have been assisted by this. Um, both this policy and the policy limiting entitlement to the child element of, um, of child tax credits were subject to detail, detailed impact analysis throughout their development. And we know that children whose parents work have improved life chances and are less likely to grow up in poverty. Chil parents receiving universal credit can get help with up to 85% of their eligible childcare costs. So it's not, a, it's, not, it's not just children over the age of three or over the age of two. This is, there is no minimum child age requirement to claim costs through working tax credits or universal credit. Uh, our u new childcare offer is backed by unprecedented levels of investment. Spending on childcare will increase to £6 billion by 2020. I was also formerly the Minister for Early Years Education. More than any other previous government we are spending on early years education and support with childcare. And finally, of course, there is the flexible support fund for those working fewer than 16 hours a week, which can be used to help fund childcare costs for a child of any age where this would otherwise present a barrier to work. So lowering the cap emphasises the message that it's not fair for someone on benefits to receive more than many more in work. And she may say that I should cross through those lines in my speech, but I think that they are the most important things of all. Even when claimants remain capped, they are better off for any work they are able to do, which means in some cases a relatively small amount of work can be sufficient to mitigate the effects of the cap. And for those impacted by the cap, we've made discretionary housing payments available to people who may need extra help and additional work order, coach time order, to help people find the sitting is suspended work. till 2.30. Order, order.